we have new drugs, we have older drugs, we have intermediate age drugs, we have drugs that are sort of in their teenage years, <laughs> we have others, others that are uh, senescent, and, and, and other ones that are just toddlers at this point, uh, or, or younger. Are, are there clear advantages to the, of the new drugs over the older drugs, and, and is it for all of them? Is it reasonable to think about new drugs and old drugs? Or how, would, how should we be thinking about these things, Eric? I, I again, it's, I feel very lucky that engaging into the neurology field, just in the last over three decades, I have seen things that are different. So sometimes it takes a century to see changes and things are moving so fast. So do I feel that the new drugs are different? Absolutely. If you look at controlling partial epilepsy, focal seizures, the answer may be not. Bromides may be just as good as the latest. But the difference is in many other areas. So even in my own practice, it definitely if I look at the evidence, there are benefits from the new drugs. There are two that are very clear to me. One was at the time that we thought about rational polypharmacy, there were not enough options to be rational. There was sodium channel and GABA. You pick one of each and that's as rational as you could get. But if you look at the mechanisms of action, it makes a lot of sense, similar to other models in medicine. Like when you treat hypertension, for example, you don't pick two beta blockers. Uh, so you try a diuretic, a calcium channel, a beta blocker, and finally you target that differently and get results. So in epilepsy it's the same. If we have different targets, that may offer benefits. And Many of the new medications were developed because of a need. So definitely there's a place. So I, I find, especially when we do like post hoc analysis and we look at different mechanisms of action, the outcome seems to be better. The other one, which is more anecdotal, but is also based on evidence-based medicine, I used to see my patient, I used to see Steven Johnson's all the time. And I used to send some patients with pathological fractures in adolescence to become adults neurology patients. We have drugs that are way more gentle on the liver metabolism, on the bone density. And yes, we, clearly we saw the effects of those drugs uh, because they were available for many, many years, more than a century in some cases, or close to a century. And, uh, but I saw that in a period of 20 years. And I have seen that in the last 20 years when I don't use them, and the difference is big. So these things that were bad, and again I said, you cannot stop every focal seizure, but you can make everybody sick, they're very important. So some of the new drugs that have now a better known effect on pregnancy, they're super welcome. Some of the bonds, uh, drugs that have a better effect on uh, bone density are super welcome. And some of the drugs, because we now pay more attention to comorbidities like cognition, are super welcome because that's the main concern of any mother that comes to my office. They said, don't make my child a zombie. So clearly there's concern and there's a reason for that. And Trevor, you said something very wise a little while ago and that is you don't present patients with uh, a treatment, this is the drug you should have, but there are a menu that one could have. How, how do you choose you know, whether you're ordering chicken or beef or the vegetarian option in that menu? It just depends who I'm speaking to. But, <laughs> uh, no, I think just to, um, to answer that question and to enlarge on, on Eric's um, uh, description, I think what we have now is more options. I don't think necessarily any specific option is better, but it's different. So for example, um, a lot of the older medications were very strong enzyme inducers and that caused significant issues, especially in elderly patients who were on multiple drugs. So even if you have a, a drug that may be equally effective, um, the fact that it's not an enzyme inducer and significantly altering the metabolism of other drugs is a significant help in terms of managing that patient. So I think when we look at treatment, we don't just look at the individual's drug about its effectiveness um, and or its adverse side effects. You look, you're looking at a whole um, um, uh, 
variation of how it specifically will affect that patient. So for example, another issue uh, that, that is specific to a specific population is the issue of the half-life. So you, if you have a drug that you can now use once a day, we know already from, from data that the less frequently that you have to give a patient a drug, the more likely they are to be compliant and take the medication, and the less likely they are to have breakthrough seizures. Now, there's a specific population of patients who believe that they are invincible, i.e. their adolescents, um, and, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's the population of patients where you may specifically eye a drug where you have that advantage. So I think it's not a class of drugs, whether it's new or old, it's having more choices and more issues within each choice that will fit that patient's needs. Does, does therapeutic drug monitoring play a role for you in your practice when you're choosing a drug and managing someone with it? Uh, it, it does. I, um, I, I, at least I see uh, epileptologists using um, therapeutic drug monitoring um, very frequently. I find it helpful to um, make sure my patient actually is um, compliant with that, their medication. And unfortunately, um, frequently, um, we'll find that their levels are much lower than would be anticipated with the drugs that I'm prescribing, and that will alter my management significantly. Um, having baseline levels when they're well controlled if they have a acute illness um, can be very helpful. In the female population um, I, that's of childbearing age, it's um, critical to have baseline um, levels of their seizure medications when they're doing well, because you'll use that as a point of comparison when they're pregnant. Um, and you know, to that point, I think getting back to um, some of the newer medications, um, I, I, and Eric made this point, there's, a, there's some of the newer medicines have very good pregnancy registry data. The very, very new medications don't have pregnancy registry data, um, even ones that we don't think of as that new anymore, um, like lacosamide. And um, so that's, a, that's something that comes into my decision making significantly and that discussion that I have. Very similar, I, I also, um, will, in my mind, typically have two or three top choice medicines and talk about the, all of them with patients. There are pluses and minuses and help guide a decision in that initial decision making process. Um, and the other piece, um, the drug drug interactions um, with the female population is the interactions with um, oral contraceptives um, that are estrogen containing, which um, a lot of our newer medications um, don't have that issue, but that's a, a really a key component to decision making.